All right, I do believe we're live. Welcome, everybody, to another episode of the Break the Rules live stream. I am your host, Lev Polyakov. Today, we are back with Jason, Dr. Jason, Riza Giorgiani, PhD, Neil, Gnostic Informant. We are here to talk about the recent UFO revelations. We're just going to go right down into it. But as always, make sure to smash that like button, smash that subscribe button, and be sure to send the Super Chats because we are going to be doing Q&A with the Super Chats after the conversation uh, itself. So without further ado, I will give you Jason Giorgiani, and we're going to start out talking about this uh, this Gorsha character and uh, what exactly these revelations are from this Intel whistleblower. We're going to get right into it. Jason, thank you very much for being here, and, uh, and away we go. So let us switch to the great Jason Riza Giorgiani. Here we are. Well, it's always great to be with you, Lev, and uh, I'm also very glad that Neil could make it here with us this evening. Um, so, listen, I watched this live broadcast last night, this much-anticipated uh, live broadcast of um, uh, the interview with David Grush. And um, parts of this had been released by News Nation in the preceding week, following an article in the debrief by Leslie Keen and um, Ralph Blumenthal. Uh, and then it was anticipated that, uh, well, not the full interview, but one hour from out of seven hours that David Grush recorded with Ross Colhart would be released. And it was last night. Interestingly enough, after the live broadcast, it was uploaded to YouTube and was only up there for a few hours before being taken down. And my guess is that certain uh, factions within the government pressured YouTube to basically uh, lamely appeal to parts of the community standards to get News Nation to make this video private. So now you can only find it on their website. Um, but let me back up and... and um, start with the article in the debrief uh, from about, I don't know, what was it now, five days ago or something like that, five or six days ago, um, because, because that's a really significant part of this story. So before we got any of the video footage of this interview with uh, whistleblower David Grush, Leslie Keen and Ralph Blumenthal published this piece about his allegations in the debrief. Now, these are the two authors of the New York Times article from 2000 and what was it, 17 originally, I believe, um, revealing the ATIP program, the, the advanced uh, you know, threat identification program at the Pentagon that had been studying UFOs in the 2000s. And then, you know, these series of sev several of these videos were released, the gun camera footage of the Tic Tac and, uh, you know, Fast Mover and other objects and so forth. And so between 2017 and 2020, Leslie Keen and, and Blumenthal were leading sort of the mainstream media disclosure of these uh, formerly classified Pentagon programs. Now, interestingly, Okay, why, why are these the two authors on this piece? And then why is it being published in the debrief? Well, they approached the New York Times with Grush's story. And both Leslie Keen and Ralph Blumenthal and also Ross Coolhart, who is the person who interviewed Grush for seven hours, over the course of, I don't know, like a year, exhaustively corroborated his story. They did deep investigative journalism to nail down you know, um, that he is who he says he is, and he had access to, to the kind of programs that he said he did. Uh, and they, they were able to secure statements from very high level military officials in support of Grush and also to um, look at some of the documentation, including a complaint he filed to the Inspector General of Intelligence, uh, where basically he's complaining about retaliation from the government for the inquiries that he's been making. And the inspector general of intelligence came back and said that his complaint was both uh, uh, credible and urgent. So they looked at all this documentation, okay? And they put this in front of the New York Times and the Washington Post and Politico and a bunch of other mainstream news sources. 
who refused to run the story. Okay. So this by itself is a very important piece of information because anyone who knows anything about journalism and intelligence knows that about 10% of all the journalists or media correspondents who work for these major newspapers and, and TV outlets are agents of the CIA. The CIA has a contingent of approximately 10% inside all of these mainstream media agencies. And now and then they, you know, exercise their capacity to suppress a story. They certainly did that in this case. So right off the bat, that tells you that at least significant factions of the government, intelligence community and so forth, don't want this story coming out. Uh, and then that was only corroborated by the fact that the YouTube video was only allowed to be up there for a few hours okay, be, before being taken down. So, so the, you, you have this article in the debrief. That was the spearhead. And then coverage by News Nation, which is a relatively small media outlet. Uh, their most prominent correspondent is Chris Cuomo, who after you know, be, being forced out of CNN, uh, went to work for them and, and helped the startup. So they're not totally obscure, they're not, but they're relatively new news agency. And they're the ones who gave Russ Colhart a platform to do this stunning interview with David Grush. Did you well, want to? Did yeah, I mean, there are so many questions to be asked. Uh, I want to see how exactly this relates to the picture you've had already of what's been going on with the UFOs in American governments and the correspondences that we've had with, uh, as you uh, talk about, these uh, various uh, different kinds of factions here. Yeah. So uh, let me know uh, what exactly thing is going on. Well, let's take it from the top. So first of all, who is this guy, David Grush? For, I'm going to try to condense yeah. all of the salient points of this interview um, for those mostly who haven't seen it, you know, and who are listening to this, and then maybe we'll go and watch it afterwards. But in any case, a Cliff's notes to this interview, okay? Uh, Grush is, as he describes himself, a blue collar uh, background uh, denizen of Pittsburgh. He's, he's from uh, a blue collar family in Pittsburgh. Uh, says that, you know, he, he basically didn't have enough money to pay for college and wound up um, getting a scholarship for physics, right, to go to, to, to college. So he has a physics background. And this is very important because we're not just talking about a guy who ultimately joins the Air Force, spends 14 years in the Air Force, particularly in Air Force intelligence, and achieves the rank of captain. OK, works on many classified missions, but someone who also has a physics background. And so when you hear him talk about these, uh, you know, unidentified aerial phenomena, whatever, these UAPs, UFOs, he is he has some insights in terms of hyperdimensional physics and how these objects might not necessarily be coming from another solar system or elsewhere in the galaxy. They may actually be slipping into our space time from uh, other dimensions or from, you could say, a, a, a hyper-dimensional domain, okay? So we'll come back to that later. But point being, very smart guy, background in physics, on top of being uh, a veteran Air Force officer. And Grush ultimately became such a prominent member of the intelligence community that he was preparing the daily intelligence briefing for the president of the United States. So this is the guy who would put together the president's daily briefing, okay? And he had access to hundreds of classified programs. I think the actual number was somewhere around 2,000 wow. different special access programs and so on and so forth. And he worked with the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency, which you know, up to recently was a very little known agency. Most people who were requesting information about UFOs through the Freedom of Information Act, you know, filing FOIA requests for government information about UFOs, were trying to get it out of, I don't know, the Air Force or the CIA or whatever, and didn't realize until recently that this agency, the, the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency, actually has the majority of data on UFOs, at least from recent years. And so Grush, worked with them and became their representative in the UAP task force. He was kind of like, he was one of four members on the UAP task force at the Pentagon. And he was sort of a representative 
uh, of the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency on that body. And as part of his work for the UAP task force, it was his duty to find out what other parts of the government knew about this phenomenon. You know, Congress passed legislation basically demanding that, this was right around 2021, basically demanding that any branch. Uh-oh, what's going on? There we go. Task force. Oh, Jason, can you please repeat the part from uh, uh, the branch because you were cut off right now? So go for it. Yeah. So in 2021, there was legislation passed where basically Congress demanded that every branch of the government report to the UAP task force whatever data they have on this phenomenon. Okay. And so Grush had congressional authorization to basically go find out who knows what about this stuff. Right. And then, of course, there have been, you know, reports throughout the years that there are programs that have been retrieving crash saucers, like at Roswell, for example, and trying to reverse engineer this stuff. And so Grush went after this. And he, like I said, he had very high level of clearance. And so he was able to discover a variety of programs to which he was denied access. And, you know, it was actually his colleagues in the intelligence community who one after another high level colleagues of his came to him and basically confessed the existence of this or that program by name and to, to the extent that he was uh, made aware of the location of the facilities where various uh, you know, crash retrieved objects were being held, uh, facilities where research and development on reverse engineering of them was taking place. And so he was able to basically put together this entire dossier of names and you know individuals' names, program names, and locations of facilities relevant to these special access projects to which he was denied access, which is illegal because Congress authorized the UAP task force to have access to all information held by any branch of the government relevant to UAPs. So, and then as he's involved in this process, he starts to get intimidated. He gets, starts to be threatened by other branches of the government start to face retaliation. And so, as I mentioned earlier, he basically issued a complaint going through, you know, the protocol that exists for that. He issued a complaint to the Inspector General of Intelligence, United States Inspector General of Intelligence. And here's the real crazy thing. The Inspector General's office comes back and says, the report is credible and urgent. And this is on record. This document exists. The journalists who covered the story have seen this document. And Grush goes on to give 11 hours of testimony sworn under oath to the Senate Intelligence Committee and the House Intelligence Committee. So he handed over everything he knows. He can't hand it over to the public because it's classified information. And he's not a traitor to the United States. Okay. But under oath, he gave sworn testimony on penalty of perjury to the House and the Senate Intelligence Committees with all of the individual's names, all of the project names, and all of the locations where these craft are being held. Wow. That is amazing. This is where we're at. So Congress now has this information, okay? And uh, so, okay, I mean, th th that's basically Grush's background. Um, now, I mean, if you want what we, what we can get into, which is a real meat of this, is what are the claims that he's making about, you know, these programs and what it is that the deep state of the United States knows? That's what I was going to ask. Mm -hmm. And I would also want to ask, uh, in line with that, how many of these reflect a lot of the things that uh, you were talking about in your book, Closer Encounters, when it comes to these various relationships that we have alleged to have with the uh, uh, remnants of the uh, Third Reich after World War II. But I'm sure we're going to get into uh, all of that as well as we uh, go. So uh, let me know. Right. Um, I mean, I'll come, I'll come back a little later to addressing that more directly. Hmm. Except that one of the interesting things that he revealed was that the first crash retrieval was from fascist Italy. So a lot of people think that Roswell was the first uh, crash retrieval. But and by the way, Grush talks about Roswell in this interview with Coldheart. And interestingly, 
uh, this is another important element in terms of the background of this story. When Coulthard put, presses him on Roswell, Grush cannot answer. He says, yes, it was a legitimate crash retrieval. It happened. But he can't get into any details of that. And this happens at a number of points in this interview. And I imagine that if you listen to the entire seven hour, uh, you know, a recording, you would see that it happened many more times because Grush actually got clearance to come out and say the things that he has, which is interesting. And we'll get into that too. Like what is going on here that one part of the government is intimidating this guy. One part of the government through media is trying to suppress this story. And yet some other part of the government has not only uh, favorably reviewed his complaint. They've authorized him to say certain things and they've forbidden him from saying other things. That's okay, so he couldn't get into Roswell in detail, but he did volunteer that Roswell was not the first crash retrieval. The first was Magenta, Italy, 1933, and Benito Mussolini ordered wow. the retrieval. So it's the fascists who have this technology first. And they had it all the way from 1933 until the fall of the Third Reich. At which point we went in and, according to Grush, we seized the technology. And, it, and he says that it was the Pope, Pope Pius, at the Vatican, who informed the Americans about the location of this uh, vehicle. And which means the Vatican knows. The Vatican has known about this since 19, well, the 30s at least, okay? Um, that by itself is a huge story, okay, that the Vatican has been sitting on knowledge of UFOs since the 1930s. Anyway, uh, that, that's the fascist angle. For the time yeah. being, I'll leave it at that. It makes you uh, wonder why, why Mussolini was so intent on conquering Greece and Egypt and Africa, all the Roman areas. Why does he want to what's, – what's he trying to find? Yeah, and, you know, the um, – the high level technical cooperation between Nazi Germany and fascist Italy starts to make a lot more sense. I mean, I discussed this at length in Closer Encounters, you know, at length. I get into the technical team that was working in Prague on this zero point energy technology in the early 1940s and how this team actually included this guy Beluzzo, an Italian, as part of a team that was predominantly German. In any case, it shed some light on the Italian angle and their involvement in the uh, Zero Point Energy Project in Prague in the early 1940s, which then, as we'll discuss later on, was transplanted to the United States and continued at companies like Martin Aircraft in the 1950s uh, in the U.S. military industrial complex. Book link in the description, by the way, for those who want to get closer encounters, that's where you got to go. So what is Grush alleging? Grush is alleging that uh, metallurgical and isotopic ratio analyses of craft that have been retrieved going back 80 years suggest that these have been engineered by what he, I think, somewhat problematically calls non-human intelligence. And we'll come back to that question, okay? But in other words, um, no conventional government or, uh, you know, recognized population or, or their scientific community has engineered these things, okay? And, and we know this because the isotopes in these metals and the, de and the degree of complexity of the metallurgy involved in crafting these vehicles exceeds uh, the scientific and technical knowledge of um, certainly any of the, the nation's you know, in the era when these objects started to be retrieved. That's one of the things that Grush is claiming. And he's also claiming that, uh, that these objects posed a significant security threat in terms of the standoff between the United States and the Soviet Union during the Cold War. That basically these reports like, you know, uh, Malmstrom Air Force Base 1967, where 10 of our ICBMs were uh, shut off. Uh, the launch capacity for 10 of our ICBMs were shut off by UFO. Um, and similar incidents where uh, uh, whole sorties of UFOs appeared over the Soviet Union in sensitive areas. 
these incidents almost triggered a nuclear war because we thought the Soviets were targeting us and the Soviets thought that we were targeting them and it could have all ended very badly. So, you know, there was this agreement in 1971 between the Soviet Union and the United States, which, which Grush points to, in particular, he points to Article 3 of this treaty in 1971 between the U.S. and USSR, uh, that's basically implying that the two countries have to maintain close communications, you know, the red phone, the emergency red phone that was on the desk in the White House, because these objects could be misidentified as an attack by one side on the other side. And so they needed to keep wow. each other informed of the UFO danger so that they didn't stumble into a nuclear war accident. All right. That's the left. Now, that just that by itself is staggering if you really think about it. OK, well, let me ask you something real quick, because you get a, you get a lot of these people that are in the military, not even in high levels, but, but like, you know, sometimes higher levels, but not even just high levels, even just normal people will say, you know, when we're up in the sky in our jets. We see things all the time. We just don't even know what they are. And we're so used to it now. It's no big deal. And you hear that and you're like, wait, what? You're like, yeah, it could be Russia. It could be China. We don't know what it is. We're just these, these weird like dots over here, a weird, weird, weird disfiguration over here. And like, what, what, why is it? It just seems like, how come no one even cares about that? It seems like something that you think people would be talking about. You would think. I mean, but, the, and you know, the degree of complacency on the part of the general public is really appalling. Uh, hopefully, this testimony from Grush will will uh, you know start to uh, move some people out of their comfort zone, and you know and 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 uh, you know flip the light bulb on in a, a little larger percentage of the population. But does Grush give any details on what it looks like, what we're what we're dealing with, anything like that at all? You know, this is this has been discussed by many other people in the past. Um, he doesn't in that one hour that's been aired. He doesn't get into that much detail, except to say that uh, some of the craft were football field sized. OK, so these were everything from the Tic Tac, which is relatively small to football field sized craft, which he says there are people who who apprised him of this information, people who were his sources who are ready to come forward under the right conditions if Congress treats this matter properly and if the media handles uh, Grush's disclosures properly, individuals are ready to come forward who have had personal interaction with craft the size of football fields, okay? And um, so it's a whole wide range of uh, vehicles that have been recovered, either intact or partially damaged and that are being reverse engineered. And in terms of reverse engineering, this is the interesting thing that he says, that while some advancements have been made on basically um, you know, appropriating this technology, due to what they call stovepiping, meaning scientists being forced to work in isolation and excessive compartmentalization, advancement on understanding this uh this engineering and this type of material hasn't been made at the rate that it could be if it were uh you know an open scientific problem right and he suggests that in particular there's one defense contractor and i know which defense contractor this is who tried to open this up a little bit and recruit a larger pool of scientists to come and study this and the pentagon immediately shut them down I mean, not, not shut down the uh, defense contractor, but they basically told them, oh, no, you're not going to. Oh, no, you're not. So, uh, so clearly, the Pentagon is still in control on some level. You know, it's been speculated that since the 1970s, a lot of these programs were moved from the Pentagon, meaning the U.S. government, into private corporations. And from Russia's testimony, it appears that well, you know, a lot of defense contracting is being is taking place. The final say is still from the Pentagon. So, yeah. So and by the way, the company that I think, you know, tried to do that it was Lockheed. And hmm. the reason I say that is because. And when did they try to do that? Now, this is a little bit staggering. Lockheed used to be Lockheed Martin. 
that was a uh, conglomerate of two corporations, one of which was Martin Aircraft. And if you look in the 1950s, throughout the press, mainstream newspapers are covering statements from aerospace executives, including Martin Aircraft, saying that they are months away from cracking anti-gravity technology, actually, that they've already cracked it, and that they're months away from rolling anti-gravity craft off the assembly line. Amazing. Okay? So this was 1954. 1954. Sorry, I'm getting I'm getting oh. texts from one of my associates in intelligence. <laughs> I shut my phone off. Anyway, shout out to the intelligence man. What's up? Good he to says, see you. Yes, yes, definitely Lockheed. Anyway, so so look, uh, 1954. Can you? I mean, you wrap your mind around that. Like, what kind of advancement has taken place in the deep state? over the last 70 years, right. almost, right? Yeah. Actually, this is one of my problems with Grush's claims, is the extent to which he's claiming that, you know, real breakthroughs haven't taken place and stovepiping is a problem for R&D and so on and so forth. Well, you know, that's probably true on some level, right? I mean, obviously, open scientific research is going to lead to greater rate of, uh, you know, insight and innovation than if you've got a bunch of people highly compartmentalized. And you don't have the best scientists working on this problem. Like, for example, Eric Weinstein, he's been very angry that he hasn't been read into these programs because he has the requisite physics knowledge to probably, you know, make significant breakthroughs and reverse engineering a lot of this stuff. And so the best scientists are not the ones working on these programs. The scientists who can be trusted to keep their mouths shut and right. be compliant are the ones working on these programs. I was just right? going to say, I think I let some guy who's on Joe Rogan every other week get in, involved in this stuff. You're out of your mind, you know? Exactly. Exactly. He is, looks, I'm sorry. I, I, I like the guy, but he's got the wrong personality profile. He's got the. Anyway, let's just leave it at that. Yeah. So, so yeah, I get it. Like what Grush is saying about compartmental. At the same time, I'm not sure that Grush's sources have been entirely honest with him about what degree of advancement has taken place. And this is a question that we can come back to when I want to speculate about the wider context for Grush's disclosures and what it represents in terms of the factionalization of the deep state. 